Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 011. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. And welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast. You are joined by yours truly, Dr. Jonathan Light and Dr. Michael Bug. Dr. Mikey, how are you doing today? Well, last time you kind of gave me shit if I say I'm doing fantastic. I'm trying to think of a different answer today. I'm, I'm, I'm hopping. Um, I'm back from the farm. Schedule is packed today. By the time this episode airs, though, um, harvest should be wrapped up. So I'll have gone back to the farm, finished that off. Um, and that's always a huge relief because it's just such a busy time. And then things will uh, calm down into the final quarter of the year. Excellent. And you guys miss the snow for all those American listeners. The snow hasn't hit here yet in Canada, in at least Western Canada. So that's exciting. That's fantastic. Congratulations to you and the family. That's a big deal. Yep, definitely. Well, we have ourselves an awesome show today. Really looking forward to this with our guests. But before we get into the details, Mike. How about our quick tip today? Yeah, so today's quick tip comes off of a conversation. So after we finished recording with Jen, we, we kept talking probably for another half hour or so. And we had a really interesting discussion. Uh, I guess I would sum it up around modeling for our kids. And what I mean by that is, as you'll hear in our conversation, she had uh, situations in her life where they had to make some decisions and we came around to talking about doing things that you would want your kid to do if they were in that same position. So I think about that in our personal life, um, me and Rosalie and how we want to model behavior for Riley. And we talked about what our basement looked like. And before we used to have a pool table and a bar. And that was kind of the vibe of our basement. And we were like, well, this isn't what we want to model for her. So we sold the pool table and, and bought a bunch of gym equipment. And now our basement is, is a bit of a home gym. And so I always think about like kids aren't going to necessarily listen to what you say. They're going to model what you do. And as veterinarians, we're, we're maybe not the best at putting ourselves first. So I would offer to try to reframe that if you're having troubles prioritizing yourself, if you can flip that over and think, what would I want my, my child to do and then show up in that way for them and that'll help them live that way. So that got a little bit long-winded, but that's the gist of, of what today's quick tip would be. A quick tip that is still gold, even though it is not super quick. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get right into it here. Uh, a quick bio. Um, Dr. Jennifer Cole is a 2008 graduate. She's joining us. She graduated from the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. She practiced small animal medicine outside of Philadelphia as an associate vet for four years before beginning a combination of part-time and relief work. In 2017, in addition to working part-time in clinical practice, she began teaching biology and human physiology labs as adjunct faculty for Penn State's University's Commonwealth Campus in Altoona, Pennsylvania. In 2019, Jen was offered a full-time faculty appointment serving as an instructor of biology. Jen has developed a Catalyst Speaker Series on campus featuring prominent scientific speakers and highlighting various career paths science majors may have never known existed. In addition, she is the creator and administrator of a Facebook group called DVM Moms Gain, a private page for veterinary mothers in government, academia, industry, and non-clinical positions. 
The page serves as a discussion board as well as a location for non-traditional veterinary job postings. Finally, she's serving her second year as an elected Pennsylvania Veterinary Medical Association Board of Trustee member, and she serves in writing bylaws, supporting political action committees, balancing the PVMA budget, and planning continuing education. In today's episode, we move through her veterinary career since 2008, having to move positions because of changes within her family life, the financial life. Then we move into the struggles and the successes of her wanting to achieve more within her personal life and looking at what is 100% responsibility for one's life. And then finally, we finish off um, in the important work she's trying to do within the Facebook group and looking at the vet industry as a whole. This is a fun conversation. She has a great sense of humor. And let's get into it with Dr. Jennifer Cole. Jen, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. This is going to be a fun conversation. I know that. I can feel that in our pre-recording discussion. Uh, I think we're going to have some great points here for our listeners today and a few laughs along the way. So thank you very much. We really appreciate you joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to share a little bit of my perspective that's it. And I think we're a place where we could start is on that perspective. You are a 2008 grad. Tell us a little bit about what veterinary medicine looked like to you upon graduation. Oh boy. So yeah, graduating in 2008 was uh, pretty much the start slash peak of the recession, right? Uh, gas was $4 a gallon. <laughs> and uh, coming out into veterinary practice as a small animal associate was a challenge. Um, the economics of learning how to be a vet um, when people were unwilling to spend money probably really shaped me into kind of the more pragmatic, um, we'll do what we can uh, and deep diagnostician that I became um, because, you know, if we've got a hundred dollars to work with, we got to figure out what we can do with that. So um, that really uh, was a challenge. Um, and uh, we had, my husband and I had this beautiful time at the beginning of middle of 2018. I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in May. Um, we were both finally working with a dual income. And uh, as somebody that um, had a startup, I uh, was working in a, a startup company for software. Um, unfortunately, the recession hit that hard for my husband, and he lost his job five months into my first veterinary job. So we've had uh, we had quite a lot of ups and downs in twenty in two thousand eight. Um, so yeah, that was a very difficult time to become a vet. Um, very difficult time to learn how to practice medicine when you couldn't do everything that you had learned in the ivory tower, right? Yes. Yep. And you went to an amazing school, learned all the great techniques, and then you come out and did you see a transition already happening within the practitioners that were in that practice meaning were they having to flex as well given the recession or had they already gone through that change and you just have to come along for the ride again i'm already going into a wormhole and we're not even a minute in i, I like wormholes uh no i think that we were all flexing at the same time because i started working in the summer of 2008 um things obviously weren't so bad that they weren't hiring that, you know, hiring had shut down. I had ample places that I could interview. Um, but I think the summer's the busy season. Yeah. And, and so coming in in the summer was significantly busier than when things kind of grind to a halt in the middle of the fall. Student or schools are open, um, parents are you know focused on that. We're not having vacations and emergency board of televaccines and things like that. So um, things really ground to a halt in the winter. And uh, one of the challenges was trying to at least see all those new exciting cases, mm -hmm. right? Um, they're not coming in. 
So I wasn't cutting things that maybe two years prior would have come in. And if they were coming in, people were opting to euthanize a GDV, you know, an eight-year-old GDV as opposed to wanting to do surgery. Um, so yeah, that, I think the practice was in the process of taking the swing, but I think we all adjusted at the same time, um, kind of in, in various ways. Okay. So. And in our pre-discussion, you spent four years in that practice. Is that correct? 2008 to 2012? I, I did. Um, I was full-time, small animal only. Mm -hmm. Very periodically saw some pocket pets. Um, but uh, that practice was a very good practice that had a good quality of care. Um, but it really, uh, after about a year, I could see that that wasn't where I wanted to be forever. Yeah. Um, I was not unhappy, but unsettled. I felt like there was something else um, that I should be doing. And uh, I toyed around with quite a few things while I was there. I tried to um, start kind of a, like a, techno a technician, lunch and learns for our techs. Um, and I, we had talked in the, in the pre-discussion, I have asked them to, um, I said, oh, there's a blocked cat coming. Everybody grab what you think you need. You know, we would have kind of these mock situations. And I loved that. I loved writing on the board, talking to my pre-vet students that were there about PCV total solids and, you know, how you don't look at one without the other. you just getting very into it. I also started writing. Um, so I started a blog. Yeah. And um, that was that was fun, um, but it became very cumbersome for me. Um, I felt like I always needed to have new material and I felt almost too young and inexperienced to really delve deeply into some of the systemic issues in veterinary medicine. Okay. And at that time, we weren't really hearing that much about the suicide rates mm. and, and as much about, um, the, the uh, burnout, um, it was much more just talking about cases um, or individual situations, which to me was interesting, but um, it, I did get, I did get some articles published, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't so much of a thing that I, I wanted to stick with. So that was another way I tried to kind of feel Switch my up. way around and, and see what I, see what I really wanted to do. Right. And um, from, that, from that standpoint, if you're you know, you were reaching out to try and try something different and grow and expand yourself within a role or outside of a role where you were already feeling a little bit of burnout and you're only four years in. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, the burnout came from first the schedule, right? Um, being scheduled uh, until 8 p.m. three nights a week, um, every fourth weekend. And that on its own would have was okay. Um, but then I had on call mm -hmm. and I had on call one night every week. And then the weekend that I was on, I would be on call for four nights, um, in a row. And then if there was a Monday holiday, I had that too. So there were times that I could have the on call phone for five nights in a row, which, um, you know, to this day, if I hear that ringtone, I kind of get like that, like gut punch feeling, you know, uh, it's really almost like a PTSD type of response where I'm just like, Oh, the cold, the cold flush. Right. And, um, because it, there were weekends, holiday weekends, it was constant. Yeah. And, um, I didn't have, um, some people can kind of shut it off and separate. I couldn't do that. I was just laying there waiting for the phone to ring again. Yeah. And that really stressed me out. Um, so in moving forward, I vowed I'd never take a job with on call again. So far, I've I've done that, yeah, but that. you know, yep. that's a that's a never say never situation. But still, that's what I'm pretty confident I'm not going to do. And so. you have kids, right? I do. I Isn't that children. 24 hours on call? From what I know from my kids. <laughs> Man, we're we're almost eight years into twenty four hours on call every exactly. day. Exactly, <laughs> it is it is constant. It uh, that never ends. Um, 
I, yeah, it's interesting what your mind does to say, well, this is okay. I can be at your beck and call 24 seven and not get paid a dime for it. Right. But if I'm at this other place's beck and call for 24 seven for four days in a row, Oh boy, that's a deal breaker. Yeah. That's a little bit of a cognitive dissonance on my end. I think (laughs) (laughs) that's how we survive. No right? offense the kids listen right? right now in future, but that's how we survive. Yeah, yeah. I won't let my daughter see this podcast till she's 18. Perfect. That <laughs> means we can go deep. I like it. So you left in 2012 that position. And it there's did. a few things that happened over the next ensuing years to bring us to where we are in 2020. Yeah. Lee, yeah. Describe some of those events because you and your husband, you guys have had to flex and and that's something that we discussed in our pre-call. You've done that and you guys have done that quite successfully from what I could gather from our call is, is you've made. It feels that way. Yeah. It it feels like maybe we're um, a little bit of the, of the Phoenix rising from the ashes at times. Um, But yeah, uh, so in 2012, um, my husband uh, got a new position. Um, He had an internet startup and in 2012, he officially got this new position, which allowed me the ability to finally um, leave the first practice that I had been at. And um, I put in my notice um, after I had interviewed at a few places, um, but I didn't have anything definitive on the book. So that's kind of a little risk right there, right? Um, but I knew that the possibilities were out there. Mm-hmm. And um, I had dabbled a little bit in some emergency referral work um, as part of my interview process, and I really liked that. Um, but then I also uh, dabbled a little bit in relief work. So I put in my notice, which was, uh, you know, three month notice. And then after I put in the, my notice, um, lo and behold, I was pregnant with my daughter. And so I left my current practice about two months pregnant. Okay. Um, so nobody knew it was a big secret, but, um, I, you know, I did the thing that a lot of us moms do. Well, nobody's going to want to hire me when I'm on, you know, when I'm pregnant or when I'm going to get hired and then I'm going to go on maternity leave. Yeah. And uh, I thought, well, what can I do? And um, I lived in the greater Philadelphia area. So we were not lacking for practices. And I jumped into relief. Um, and I did relief work at the emergency referral hospital and then a number of small animal practices in that greater area. Um, and I really liked it because I could pick my hours. I didn't have on call. I didn't get bogged down in the bureaucracy of a one single practice. Um, and it felt very freeing, but I was still using my veterinary degree and paying off those student loans and, you know, doing what I needed to do. Um, so we were kind of cruising along. I took some time off when my daughter was born at the end of 2012 and um, tw- in 2013. And um, we decided we were going to move closer to my husband's work. Mm-hmm. We put our house on the market. And um, I was working very part time in the relief work and raising my daughter, keeping her out of daycare um, because of the costs, right? And uh, I found out that my husband's company um, folded. And we, this is something that happens in software, right? Um, and in you know, the IT industry. And um, so here we were. Um, he was not contractually obligated to work anywhere. I was not contractually obligated to work anywhere. And we had some really rapid decisions we had to make. Yep. Right. Do we stay put? Do we, do we stay where we uh, have family nearby, where we kind of know the situation and know that I could have an infinite pool of relief work if I wanted it? Or do we... Um, leave the house on the market, sell and pick a new place to live and kind of start over. And at that point, I had lived in the Philadelphia area from 2004 when I started veterinary school to 2013. And that was enough for me. I mean, nine years in a big city. um, We decided uh, within the span of 24 hours to leave our house on the market um, and kind of looked around. and found uh, a new place to live. We uh, decided we liked the uh, 
country and culture of where I'm at now, which is the center of Pennsylvania, which we have um, major university Penn State here. And, uh, but you can drive five minutes and be in the middle of the wilderness. So that was the first thing we did. And then we, um, yeah, go ahead. Can I jump in that one for one second? Like that's a big change, which many people don't want to or cannot make both within their own mind. And then um, I'll say it as it is. Sometimes we use the excuses of life to say that that change isn't possible. How did the two of you with a daughter now decide to make that choice? That was, uh, I don't like change. Let's just put that out there right now. I do not do well with major changes. I don't even like changing dinner plans 24 hours in advance, okay? <laughs> so this was um, kind of one of those situations where we got a chance to reinvent ourselves. And those situations only come so many times in your life. Mm-hmm. You go to college, you can be who you want to be. Yep. You go, to, But once you're there, you're not, you've established that persona, right? You go to veterinary school, you can also be who you want to be. Your first new day at a practice, you can reinvent yourself. But the, again, those life opportunities don't come up very much. We had the chance to both reinvent ourselves and um, we're pretty actually excited about that. What made me actually decide to embrace the change? I was scared. I didn't always embrace it. There were nights of tears. You know, what are we doing? Why are we moving away from family? We've got an infant, but we did it anyway because we thought it was gonna be the best choice for us. Um, And also our family, right? Um, Moving to an area with good schools, moving to an area with outdoor activities, um, where my kid could play in the yard and we didn't have to worry. Um, Those are really important factors for us. So yeah, I didn't love the change. Um, It wasn't, like I said, it wasn't always pretty, but we did it anyway. So that's one of those kind of just tenacious grit your teeth and and um one of the mantras that my husband and i had were nothing's forever right if we moved here and we hate it we can move again right so it's not the end it's nothing's forever it's not the end of the world if you move someplace and you don't like it there are plenty of choices so and now moving ahead uh this plays suit right into even your current role because everybody on the podcast here, which will have heard your intro by this time, uh, knows that your current role is again, something that you've had to flex and change and persevere into its current form. So I think tell the audience how this has come to be. You are where you are in 2020. Okay. I've always loved teaching. I've, always liked the i've always felt like there was an an itch i couldn't scratch and i tried that with my blog i tried it with my lessons for my technicians right um i tried to implement changes in the practices i was at and i always liked it and after i had my second child in 2016 i found myself in a situation where my part-time hours at the practice uh, that i had worked at um, were disappearing Mm -hmm. and it stung right but again it was a chance to reinvent myself i've always wanted to teach i never thought i could do it because one i don't have a teaching degree yes right Two, I don't have a PhD. So getting into the university just on my doctorate, uh, you know, in veterinary medicine probably wasn't going to be enough. Um, But I thought, well, what do I have to lose? And I think that's the benefit of getting older, right? You just stop, you stop caring as much about people saying no to you. Um, And I started looking um, in the spring of 2017 for local teaching positions. Now, I live in a major university town. The likelihood of me actually getting a position at the major university was pretty slim. Um, But uh, I did look, we've got a number of other universities in the area, and I always kept an eye out, and I found an adjunct teaching position um, at one of the Commonwealth um, schools for Penn State that's about 40 minutes from my home. And I thought, I'll apply. 
right? And the position was for a biology lab instructor. Um, I have no teaching experience, but I talk to clients, right? I take renal disease and I turn renal disease into an understandable um, concept. So I thought, I can do this. I know I can do this. I just need to convince somebody else that I can do this. And I interviewed and um, they actually offered me that position and they also offered me a position teaching human physiology. So this is kind of my foray into starting to teach human medical courses. I said, well, mammals are mammals. So, you know, I, there's really not much difference me talking to you about a dog versus a human. Um, so I took that adjunct position and boy, was it a learning curve. Um, I had to relearn a lot of stuff. I hadn't used photosynthesis for 20 years. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, I had to relearn a whole lot of stuff, um, but it was fun. And I had students who wanted to go into the sciences who were still bright eyed and they weren't jaded yet, right? <laughs> and they were so excited to learn some cool things and I could pull in all my clinical correlations, which is a lot different than a lot of the researchers that also teach these courses because they don't do that. Um, so I did adjunct work. I taught anatomy, I taught physiology, and I taught the biology lab for two years. Um, and it was, it, it, it was fun, right? I didn't think it would necessarily go anywhere. I hoped it would, but I didn't. And I was still working part-time in the veterinary hospital at the same time. And that was a question and, that I was going to have is you were working as a locum part-time, you know, picking up some hours here and there. How was it on the psyche that your full-time job was actually not even in veterinary medicine now? How, how did you... How does that, you, you um, rationalize that or talk about that with others or how did you put that forward to yourself and others? So people, when people asked me why I wanted to teach and not, you know, I'm using my veterinary degree in both education and my life experiences. I'm not necessarily using it to practice medicine on animals when I'm at the university. Right. But I could not have gotten where I was without the knowledge that I have amassed over a decade of veterinary experience. And so um, when I kind of talked about, you know, in, in the interview process, you know, what's the question? Why do you want to do this? I love it. What else can you say? It's fun. Um, I like to teach and I love bringing little clinical pearls in with my students um, because I remember being so hungry for that when I was an undergrad. Um, just give me something tangible that actually makes this relatable to what I'm going to do in the future. Um, and so we do a lot of that now. Um, we talk about radiographs and, and and, you know, what's a heart attack and, you know, a lot of stuff to make it really relatable. So um, as far as explaining, you know, lack, not using my veterinary degree, I'd argue that I am. Nice. Um, I, I, I would argue that I am using it. I'm using also the communication skills that I've built over the years to do that. Um, I've kind of got, there's this joke on campus that my listening skills with my students have now opened me up to the too much information from your student category because now they know they can come to you with anything. And the way that our clients come to us with maybe a little too much information, my students have also picked up on that. And one of their um, frequent things they say is um, that I am very relatable and um, I seem to be like a, one of the people that they could talk to, you know, nice. if, they, if they want to. So I have, st I have students that talk to me about their own medical problems. I have to remind them like, I'm not your MD. Like you, you should, but uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a really fun role to be in and it's very unique um, because yeah. I come at it from this clinical perspective, which is a completely different thought process and way of thinking than the academic, the traditional academic. Somebody that's done research majority of their career. Mm -hmm. 
And mm-hmm. so you, you now have communication skills you've built up, you have counseling skills you've built up. And has that been, uh, has that been a proactive conscious choice? Like, have you taken communication skills workshops? Have you gone additional training or is this built up over experience? Cause the type of experience you've gained over the last 10 years, a lot of that is in work, in time, in seeing cases. What else have you done outside of that to ensure that you could be the best you could be with your students? Really interested to, to dive into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so there are, just like there are continuing education conferences for vets, there mm-hmm. are continuing education conferences for educators at every level. Um, we have, um, you know, certainly, you know, the, the pedagogy, right? Um, the pedagogical approach. Um, there, there, I didn't even, I had to Google that when that was an interview question that I saw come up. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Um, We're going to have to do that uh, after this for, for, this <laughs> one of the three of so us for sure. It's, it's, your, it's your thought process um, and your approach to how you teach. Right. So there's the kind of what most of us were probably taught in both undergrad as science majors and then in veterinary school, we get taught um, kind of much more didactically. Mm -hmm. Somebody stands up front, they draw a chemistry equation on the board, they kind of teach it, you go home, you study your PowerPoint or your handout or your notes, and that's it. Then there's other approaches which are more student led. Um, That's a little harder in the sciences to like generate a discussion on the femur, right? But um, (laughs) but, uh, there are student led, there's um, active learning. There's a number of different approaches. I didn't know these existed before I started teaching and yet here I am teaching and then I'm learning about what my approach is. Um, Oh, there's a name for that, right? Um, I'm the, by the way, the C1 do one or C1 uh, do one teach one approach that's me um, with my students I'm like you know watch me do it now you do it now tell your classmate how to do it right um, but uh, there's continuing ed for us um, I have taken um, an excellence in academic advising course I took a one-month course from Yale um, on human anatomy from the medical school <laughs> um, Wow. And uh, which just confirms for me that veterinary medicine was the right choice. But um, the, the human anatomy cadaver course was interesting. Uh, and that's to make me a better human anatomy and physiology professor, right? Makes um, sense. Totally. I, yeah. You yep. know, I, I'm, taking, um, I'm taking a course now on how to engage my students in different levels of learning because not everybody learns well. And right now we're in this online, strange twilight zone. Sometimes we're in the classroom, most of the time we're on Zoom and we're losing students. They can't, they're not doing well with this. And so we're trying to take these courses on help, helping students learn well in this online environment. So um, yeah, there have been a lot of things that I've done. And um, I'm not gonna lie to you, there's some of the fly by the seat of your pants. Yep. You know, that, that we do in veterinary medicine, right? That first weekend you're on call, it's you. Yep. So you're going to read it in a book and you're going to manage it. Or you're going to text your friend, Mike, right? And say, <laughs> Mike, how do I play? How do I do this? I don't know what I'm doing, right? So there's some of that too. And um, thankfully, I've got a really good framework of people that I work with that are willing to help me too, which is a key in any job, right? Having really folks that are willing to help you out. Yep. Jen, I love it. I love the, um, both the enthusiasm, the effort and the consciousness you have in wanting to both grow and expand. But something we talked about in the pre-call is not just letting yourself be the victim. I don't hear any perspective of victimhood here. You came out in the recession, your husband lost their job, his job, you know, had a, had a lucrative start to a startup and, and it turned down. You had part-time work that went astray. You had two, you know, your, your, your children and not being able to get mat leave and then coming back and then making this role happen. There's so many examples there. Is that something innate that lives within you as opposed to something that you've always had to build from a confidence and going, I can do it. What does that look like to you? As a child, um, I would 
not have been allowed to flounder without trying as hard as I could, right, to, um, to overcome. And I think that classic perfectionist type A first child personality trait that, that I have, that so many of us have, right, um, that gets us into medicine, I think that's just given me a drive to, um, to really prove myself. Uh, I don't ever feel like I've arrived. Um, I feel like we constantly have room for improvement and um, I am completely responsible for what happens to me. Um, I will not um, be a victim of things. I mean, circumstances can stink for sure, and they can make life harder. But, uh, you know, we've proven as a family, probably a good three or four times in, in you know, our in our marriage and our, our life together, that we can pick the pieces up. And every single time, and this is a really important thing that people need to hear, every single time we have picked the pieces up and we have put ourselves out there and taken a risk, things actually were better than they were before that happened. Now, not to say that that's going to happen that way for everybody every time, but the times that we have stepped out on the ledge, taken the risk, we have had a dramatic improvement in our quality of life, uh, an improvement in our income, right? Um, and it's opened a ton of doors for us. So, I mean, I'm here on this podcast because apparently I'm interesting. I couldn't have picked I couldn't have imagined that 10 years ago, you know, as a, as a little vet that was just lancing some abscesses and trying to poke around on a blog. Um, so we have, we have really taken the leap. Um, and even as, as recently as yesterday, um, you know, struggling with my, my kids to try to just get their stuff done. We've all been there. Um, just put the shoes on. We need to go, right? And the, the littlest one is going to be four. It starts to cry and says, I don't know how. And this is that building the tenacity, right? Building the grit. You do know how. We're not going to cry over it. We're just going to find a solution. And so I think my parents probably did that with me too. Um, and that's why just reinforce that, you know, we don't get upset. You're not a victim here. Fix it. You're in the driver's seat. Fantastic. So. You shared in pre- discussion about one of the gentlemen that came to chat with you in your VBMA chapter in school. And I think yes. this resonates with me. Do you mind sharing me with us what that quote was and how you think about that in today's yeah. world? Yes, definitely. Um, so I'll, I'll launch into my Facebook page from here if you don't Please. mind. But, Not at all. Um, so <laughs> Mike's smiling in, in the background. <laughs> Um, yeah. when, uh, so at, and at school, um, at Penn, uh, we had a speaker come, um, and he was our keynote speaker and he was the owner of a very major, um, bank, um, in the United States. Um, so this was a big deal, a big donor. We now have a building named after him, um, a brand new teaching building and somebody offered up a question. We had a chance for some Q&A and somebody said, hey, you know, what do we do if we're in this job and we're unhappy? How can you, ch how can you change the job, right? How can you, basically the question was, how do you affect change in your job? And what he said has stuck with me now, what, 15 years later. And he said, you, basically, you can't change the job you either need to accept it or you need to change something within yourself. And that has just bounced off the hallways of my brain for a decade and a half. And um, if you're unhappy, right? My first job, I was not happy. I was on call, I was burnt out. Grabbed the reins and said, this place isn't gonna change. 
So I either need to just suck it up and deal with it and just accept it as my fate, or I need to change something within myself or change my circumstances. I opted to change my circumstances. And I have done that multiple times um, where I have been discontent in my career and, or I have known the direction I've wanted to go, maybe not sure how to get there. And my stepping stones have kind of been, you know, sideways sometimes, but um, I have used that mantra. Okay. The situation's not going to change. So I need to accept it or I need to to change something within myself. Um, So, that is where the academic aspect of my, yeah. of my career has come from. I've always wanted to do it, didn't think I could, yep. went out on the limb, applied for the job, convinced somebody to give me a chance, proved myself, got offered the full-time faculty position, um, and I'm happy right now. Um, but there are a lot of uh, people out there that aren't happy. Yep. in veterinary practice. Yep. Um, the pandemic has only, uh, has only magnified things for us here um, because we're busy. Every practice is really busy. And um, people are putting in long hours. Um, I think that the clients have gotten a little bit more discontent as time has gone on. But I, I, even without the pandemic, there's a lot of burnout. There's a lot of um, discontentedness in the profession. Um, We've got lack of flexibility, lack of maternity, paid maternity leave, right? Long hours. We've got 80% of graduates being women that are coming out of veterinary school. A lot of them want families. They're trying to figure out how to be a brand new vet and how to start a family at the same time. And they're torn between career and family as always happens with us. Um, So about a year ago, um, after I was this full-time faculty member, um, I decided to do a branch off Facebook Mm -hmm. group. Um, So there's a Facebook group for those who don't know. Um, It's private and sorry, it's for for gals only, but it's called DVM Moms Life in the Trenches. Mike and and I tried to get on. She didn't let us on. I don't know why. No, like, sorry. (laughs) Uh, It's a fun group. We (laughs) Bounce clinical cases off of each other. So, you know, second opinion, what would you do with this? We bounce mom stuff off of each other, right? Um, from infancy all the way through teenagers and even adult children, we've celebrated grandchildren on that page. Wow. Um, but what has come through, uh, was coming through time and time again was, I'm just fed up. I need to get out of this. I, I am so unhappy you know, I can't keep these hours. I can't, I can't be there for my kids. I can't, you know, this, that, and the other thing. How do I get out of clinical veterinary medicine? And I, I decided that why not? Let's, let's form a group so we can figure out how, you know, to best um, help and support each other, find that new position that could make us happy. And so I I started this Facebook group. Um, it's a branch. It's called DVM Moms um, Gain, and that's G A I N. And the acronym stands for Government, Academic, Industry, and Non Clinical Vets. And I started that about a year ago. We have about 900 people in the group so far. Yeah. Um, and what do we do in that group? We don't do as we don't do case consults because we're not we're not clinical. Now, see, I'm still clinical a little bit, but mm-hmm. so I dabble in both. But um, we talk about the academic um, veterinarians, and we've got veterinarians at vet schools as well as universities like I am. Um, we talk about the government positions and the regulatory positions. Some of these I didn't know existed, and I started the page. Um, nice. industry jobs, right? Uh, very interesting industry jobs. And then the non-clinical, we have vets that have started their own business that has nothing to do with veterinary medicine, um, but uh, maybe have used the skills they learned in in, um, in business, right? Or yeah. as a veterinarian to yeah. launch that. So um, that is a, uh, 
that is kind of a love child of mine. Um, I'm probably going to have to add another admin soon just because it's hard to keep up. Um, but, uh, we have posted jobs there. Okay. So this is a confidential private, private group. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, because uh, when I have new members come in, they need to go to a pinned post and they need to let me know where they're at academic in industry. Right. But one of the buttons we have is uh, in the poll is I need to get out of clinical veterinary medicine. Right. I'm looking for the escape hatch. Um, because they're burnt out. They can't find the hours that are good for them. Um, they just find that they're unhappy. And um, that's probably 60 to 70% of my respondents. So, you know, 500 people in that group are unhappy in a clinical situation and are trying to find other ways to use their veterinary degree. Yeah. Um, and most of them only think that they can teach at a vet tech school yeah. or they can go work for one of the big food companies as a representative. And that's pretty much it. And so what I've done is um, I have uh, looked into the, government and regulatory jobs, industry jobs, things that maybe you wouldn't think would need a veterinarian. And seeing what's possible there. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And especially given your full-time role, full-time mother, full-time wife, community member, all of the breast and still wanted to be an active member of this group and, mm -hmm. and, or take it on yourself. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, that, that is very impressive. And that shows the, the leadership value of what you're bringing forward. Again, if you don't want to just live with it, then change yourself. And, and you're the perfect example of that. Unfortunately, we're coming up to our time already. And again, I feel like, I know we're up, we're, we're up already. And, and we've only the themes that we wanted to get into today. Uh, Mike, anything before we leave there that jumps out to you in terms of wrap up, I, Again, we could keep on going here, but yes, absolutely. I've been silent because I just wanted to stay out of your way, Jen. Um, that was amazing. Anyone that is that's listened to this episode, like go back and listen twice. Anyone that's in that like unhappy position, like everything you were saying is just gold. And I've I've heard it said that that people would rather remain unhappy then be uncomfortable and hearing your story of your willingness to temporarily make yourself uncomfortable to go and seek out that that place that will make you more happy and i loved how you put it that opportunity to reinvent yourself and i would even argue it's it's kind of that opportunity to discover yourself or even to finally give yourself permission to step into what you always wanted to do. Like I was just sitting here listening. That's why I said nothing. I was literally speechless. Um, amazing, amazing story. Well, thank you. That's excellent. Jen, with that now, we need to move into the impact round. And what the impact round for us, Jen, is a series of short questions that you can take of as whichever direction you would like to. And the first question is, are you a cat or a dog person? Cats. Without a doubt. I even wore my cat shirt today. Oh, I oh, never even God. noticed. I've been I know. For an hour. Cat, Another cat, cat shirt. Cats. Wow. It's, yeah. it's all about cats because they're just those little sociopaths that can do whatever they want and part of me is just a tad jealous, right? Because you feel like they can say whatever they want and they get away with it because they're cute. Yep. True or false? I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a kid. False. Mm -hmm. I was going to be a pilot. I was going to be a volcanologist. I was going to be a, um, I started college pre-med. I was going to be an ER trauma physician. So Cool. It's always been animals and then it shifted to medicine, yep. but, um, it's, uh, no, I didn't always want to be a vet. Okay. How would your friends describe what you do for a living? 
Gosh. Um, so when I tell people what I do, they go, you're busy, right? I think they think my life is chaotic and maybe it is. Um, but I think they know that I'm a veterinarian. So there's the old, oh, puppies and kittens and little fluffy things. Um, but they also know that I teach at a university. Um, so some of them have this image of the old um, library with the brown leather sofa that is not my office. It is government beige, right? Um, <laughs> so, so I think that, I think that um, there's a lot of misperceptions, but I do think that they are probably right in thinking, going, wow, you're busy. Because I am. I'm very busy. Okay. What uh, is your favorite hobby? Oh, boy. So I love to kill plants. Um, so I buy, I buy house plants and then they die. Um, but I also love to landscape a ton. Um, I love to plant. Um, I'm planting a garden. I am uh, in charge of my daughter's school garden. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite hobby besides that and cooking. Nice. What in this world are you most grateful for? Besides my, my family, right, and my children, which are, of course, uh, everything, um, I think I am most grateful for, for those failures, right, for the businesses that failed, for um, the job that didn't pan out. Uh, because that has really taught me and my husband um, to function um, at our best. You know, we, we become tenacious and um, largely unstoppable. So, right there, quoted right there. Love it. Jen, for those that want to reach out to you, continue this conversation, get to know you better, where do they reach out to? I'm in the Facebook group um, for you guys. So you can reach me there. You can, um, if you're a vet mom, and we do take some non-moms, but no guys, sorry. Um, you can come to the DVM Moms Gain group, um, or you can email me. Um, and it's uh, J-K-O-E-H-L-V-M-D at Gmail. Fantastic. And with that, we have come to the end of our time period together. Uh, this has been a blast. This has been exactly what I thought it would be in our pre-conversation. A lot of fun, a lot of silent laughs. <laughs> we respect your, your time because this has been fantastic and uh, hope to have you on again in future and really look forward to seeing where your career continues to trend as uh, only positives for you, your husband and your family. It's been fantastic. So thank you. Uh, thank you. As always for our um veterinary guests is the last word goes to you and to what message do you want to leave for the veterinary community jump into the chaos just do it thank you for listening to the veterinary project podcast as a recap on behalf of our hosts the veterinary project podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly so be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived if you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know please like love and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing as we're available on all the usual suspects if you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. <laughs> <laughs>